First of all, can I just check um, whether anybody has left any team in particular? So is there any team here which only has four members in it now? That's good news. So we've still got complete teams. And there's a couple of teams there with one member in by the look of it. <laughs> You're right. OK, I think we'll make a start. OK, this morning's lecture is going to be about open versus closed innovation. Ah, you need to put this in, that's why. Um, and roughly speaking, the, the overall agenda for today is um, looking at the reconfiguration of business models or business and service models. So we start off by looking at open versus closed innovation, then we go on to crowdsourcing, then product service systems, and then open design. And roughly speaking, the lectures will be about 30 minutes. You'll do about 15 minutes group exercises where you try to apply some of the theory and the methods to your particular projects. Um, and then we'll take a 15 minutes break and re-adjourn. Um, so why these topics? Again, they all have this theme of trying to reconfigure your business model and the service you're offering. Uh, anyone got any questions about those topics? I'm sure they'll come later today. So first of all, what is open innovation? Do we have any, uh, anybody who's done a course on open innovation before? Any suggestions? Go ahead. Last time we defined open innovation as innovation where we bring in a lot of people's uh, opinion and mind. Um, as an example, uh, an engineer and they at the moment uh, try to make people crowdsource. Okay. And that is uh, one way of open innovation. So, gentleman at the front here suggesting bringing in the opinions and ideas of lots of people in the form of crowdsourcing, and that's one type of open innovation. Anyone got any other suggestions what might constitute open innovation? Go on then. <laughs> but also we can say that open innovation compared to closed innovation that is uh, inside the company where we uh, use our own knowledge to uh, develop a product, open innovation is more like a product group so it's more open and maybe not settled as a company yet. Okay. So it's something to do with really extending the company boundaries. So rather than saying all your product development is going to be done within your company, you open up to external sources. Um, if we want a definition um, or a description of what open innovation is, we can look for the uh, Oxford English Dictionary. Here's a picture of the first edition. Uh, but open innovation won't appear in the dictionary, but the dictionary itself is a very good example of a practice of open innovation. Um, so when it was first being created, it had a whole bunch of enthusiasts sending letters of quotations and definitions and slips. You can see this uh, picture of this, um, these letters in the bottom right-hand corner. So basically, enthusiasts would send in uh, definitions for inclusion in the dictionary. So it was very much done on the basis of the crowd, the populace, uh, contributing uh, definitions and terms for the creation of the dictionary. So in itself, the Oxford English Dictionary was a sort of crowdsourced or open innovation uh, product. The godfather of open innovation, well, the academic godfather at least, was uh, Henry Chesborough. Um, and his book in 2003. Now, even by his own admission, he says open innovation was going on a long time before he actually phrased it. But the problem was there was no theory behind it. So people knew they were doing it as something, but they didn't really have a term for it, and they didn't have a real theoretical basis from which to describe it. Now, Chesper describes it as a paradigm that assumes that firms should use external ideas as well as internal ideas 
and internal and external paths to market as the firms look to advance their technology. So opening up the uh, company boundaries, you can take your product to market through other people's companies and you can take their products to market through your company. Uh, here's a nice uh, cartoon of the power of innovation, of open innovation. So here's a bit of theory on why opening up is difficult uh, for the different companies. Has anybody heard of game theory? We've got one, two. Uh, this little example is called the prisoner's dilemma, and this shows why people find it difficult, or companies find it difficult to open up. So we have two bank robbers, or house robbers, robbing a house. Um, I'd like you just to assume in your groups, the person furthest this side is robber A, and the person furthest this side is robber B. The police come along and they bust the two robbers. <coughs> so the two robbers enter the house, the police catch them, and then due to a lack of evidence, they can only be charged with trespassing. Um, I don't know whether this is the correct Danish translation. It was a Google Translate, but I wasn't sure whether trespassing would translate too well either. Is it right? No. no. <laughs> okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> that's not what they're being tried for. <laughs> oh, the dangers of Google Translate. Um, um, and they are given the offer, so the, the police take them into separate rooms, uh, so the guys in the middle of your group are the police, um, and they're told if they both remain silent, they will receive one year each jail sentence. So they don't confess, they don't tell the police that it was the other person as well. If they both confess, they both get five years. But if one confesses and the other doesn't, the one that confesses and dobs the other one in gets zero years, and the one that didn't confess gets 20 years. Now, just, I'll just give you a, a quick minute in your group just to decide, prisoner A, what would you do? You're taken into a side room and you've got to decide whether to confess or not. So just in your groups, have a little discussion. What would your decision be? Okay, so in your groups, hands up if prisoner A would decide to keep silence. So we've got about half the groups, and just to check, hands up if you think prisoner A would normally confess. Okay, roughly about half as well. Um, so really, if you go through the logic, prisoner A should always confess or more often than not. And the reason being, if you convert everything into a two by two matrix, um, so you can see here they lose out five years of their life each if they both confess. Here they lose one year of their life each if they both keep silent. Well, if we just take prisoner A and he decides to think, okay, well, what happens if prisoner B confesses? Now, if he stays silent, 
he'll get minus 20 years, so he'll be 20 years in prison. And if he can, decides to confess, he'll be five years in prison. So by confessing in this situation, he'll have saved 15 years of his life. Now, if we take the other scenario, um, so in this case, prisoner B decides to remain silent. Well, if he remains silent, he gets one year in prison. And if he decides to confess, he gets zero years in prison. So even in the second situation, he still saves a year of his life. So this kind of paradox is, oop, is called the prisoner's dilemma. And it's one of the reasons why conservative industries, well, conservative industries hold their uh, knowledge tightly as they see it as power. Um, and most stakeholders are slaves to the prisoner's dilemma, knowing that if they can't really trust their business partners, the best thing to do is always confess, or in other words, by analogy, keep your knowledge wrapped up towards you. Now, there's a, a really good article by uh, Van der Verde on open innovation. And um, apologies, he or she suggests um, that there are seven different ways in which, or seven different activities which can promote open innovation within companies. So the first set are exploration activities. Firstly, venturing. So this is where you start up or spin out uh, new organizations. Does anybody know what the term spin out means? Or spin off? Go ahead. When you make a spin off, you normally look at your core product and uh, maybe make something that is a little different. Um, you can also do that as ventures. And when you spin off uh, your technology, your knowledge uh, base, um, as when Sony start making a mobile phone with Sony Ericsson and use that corner of some, some of the things and share with others. Okay. Um, I, I would uh, I'd say not, not quite, but, um, but it's sort of close. Generally speaking, it is when you produce something which is perhaps not core to your company's fundamental values or technology strategy um, and is perhaps diluting your own strategy. So they produce a spin-off business, a side entity, um, and it spins off because you take, the mother company takes shares in that business, so owns a considerable uh, aspect to it. And that, the, those number of shares will equate to the amount of staff given over to this spin-off company and the technology and intellectual property given over to it. But essentially speaking, from that point on, they are two separate entities. Both companies are completely separate. And they're willing, they're completely okay to have their own technology development strategies and product development strategies. So Van der Verde says a very good indicator of whether a company is open and practicing open innovation is the number of spin-offs uh, they can produce. The next indicator is whether they outsource intellectual property um, or outward licensing. So in other words, instead of keeping all your intellectual property wrapped up and not letting anyone use it, they decide to license it out and sell it off and let people develop it and spin it off. And of course, that can uh, lead to lots of other opportunities because there may be applications of these patents and technologies that the mother company doesn't really know about. Also, employee involvement. This is a sort of internal cr uh, crowdsourcing. This is where you get all your company, um, all your employees to make suggestions of ideas for research and development. And in the really, truly open innovation companies, uh, these individuals from within the company won't be confined to the company boundaries. So they're free to take their ideas elsewhere to spin off their own companies. And we see that in, in firms like Google, who actually offer a third of their time to certain individuals to start up their own ventures. And it can be nothing to do with Google's uh, primary strategy. In terms of exploration, uh, we have customer involvement. Oh, the same. Oh, yeah. So this is uh, similar to uh, the uh, internal involvement, except you're involving uh, customers in the process. So you're looking at customers to help you develop 
I intellectual property help to develop your technology. So you bring them into the process of research and development. It's also external networking, so it may not be your com um, customers, but it may be some of the other stakeholders in providing a product or service. So it might be some of your parts suppliers or component suppliers. So Toyota are particularly good at this. Um, and then there's external participation. So this is, uh, it can be seen as crowdsourcing. And then two more. Um, outsourcing R&D, where you pay another third party firm to do your research and development for you. And inward IP licensing. So this is when you buy patents and intellectual property off other firms and take their research and development to market. And of course, they will be getting some kind of market share um, for you doing this. Um, so those are the sort of seven indicators of open innovation within a company. But now if we do a comparison of closed innovation versus open innovation, we can see the mindset of closed innovation is to hire the best and the smartest and keep them as long as you can. Whereas open innovation is you recognize that there are lots of smart people in the world who exist beyond your company boundaries. Closed innovation, you try to put these innovators in special conditions, uh, whereas open innovation, um, you open your networks to a diverse range of talents. Um, in closed innovation, innovators are free from market pressures to innovate within a firm. So you see some of these innovation hubs within large companies, these kind of fluffy cells um, with bean bags and dartboards and things like that within companies trying to nurture their creative individuals. Um, whereas in the open innovation side, it's much more market focused out to the real world, getting your innovators out to experience, experience other companies and other things. There's a difference between closed innovation and open innovation in terms of closed innovation is very push orientated. So they start with the idea and they're constantly developing this idea until it's a mature technology until they can push it out into the marketplace. Whereas open innovation is much more bi-directional. So you're not only pushing out the technologies, but you're also trying to uh, bring them in as well to uh, enhance your own capabilities. And also, Open innovation will often be delivering to passive customers, whereas open innovation will be delivering to engaged customers. So in open innovation, the customers will know about the design specifications and what the purpose of the product is from the beginning, whereas closed innovation, they won't know until they receive the product. Any questions on the difference between open and closed innovation? Okay, so here's uh, Henry Chesper's uh, diagram or visualization of what closed innovation is about. And he describes it by this ideas funnel. Uh, so here's where you have a base of science and technology, uh, a very divergent pool of different ideas and different potential technologies, which are then funneled through a development process. Some of them are, are removed through stage gates and some are developed until they're taken to the market. So this is research and this is uh, development and execution. And there's been some great successes in the, um, in the 20th century of closed innovation. For example, the, the chemical industry, um, electrification, uh, the Rockefeller and Standard Oil, the World War II scientific achievements, and uh, Chandler suggests internal R&D has been key to the rise of modern US uh, corporation in the 20th century. So what's changed? Well, if you look at some key figures of the rising costs of R&D, 25 years ago, it costs $50 million to produce a new drug on average. Nowadays, it's more like in excess of 800 million. So that's a 16 fold increase. And also 10 million um, on average cost for new consumer products whereas now it's more like 50 million. So the price of product development has increased with the increasing complexity of designs. Here's some figures which show the, the strength and might of, um, of mass production. So it's suggesting 
that large firms in 1980s had a much more, uh, well, had a much greater impact uh, in the market share than they do nowadays. So that's a 30% decrease. So it's showing there's not so much strength in numbers from a company's point of view. So the large corporations and organizations no longer have as much influence as they used to 30 years ago. So if we take by comparison, here's the closed innovation funnel which we saw a moment ago, aiming towards a market which the uh, company's strategy is focusing on. The open innovation uh, model proposed by Chespera is this kind of open or hold funnel where you can take an internal knowledge base and continue to target your current market. You can also, from your internal knowledge base, try to spin off and fire at uh, separate markets, not really part of your original strategy, um, and allow other firms to take it to market for you. You can take external technologies through your process and aim at a separate market from which you would normally be able to achieve. You can take external technologies and help them enhance your own product development to reach your own targets. Um, and also include venturing, uh, internal externing venturing to take in internal knowledge uh, to create new markets for yourself. So this is basically the idea behind open innovation and the exchange between internal and external ideas will help you diversify the offerings you can give. Um, so open innovation separates uh, innovation into multiple stages. So it's a bit more like a relay race than a marathon race. So in other words, you do a bit of research and development and you can pass the baton on to a more specialist firm or organization who will then continue the research and development and then pass it back later or pass it on and pass it on. Uh, lab and testing equipment has been fundamentally important in this uh, paradigm. So until you could validate your ideas and show that you were delivering what you said you were delivering, what you were offering, there was no real trust to be had from open innovation. Other companies couldn't trust that you could deliver the things you were saying you were delivering. But uh, as lab and testing equipment uh, has improved, uh, it's given suppliers confidence that a good product was delivered and it enables the innovation button, the relay button, to be passed on more efficiently and effectively. So a couple of quick case studies for you now. Here's the IBM case study. Um, they had an extremely closed uh, innovation cycle where they would target a specific product um, and they would develop it all from internal sources. Um, I think that was, I don't know if you can see it there, but I think it was about 93. I'll just check the date. Yeah, so this was the uh, pre-1993 uh, version of IBM's model. And very simplified by Henry Chesper, you can see how they opened up to a, a in a formal way, to uh, different um, original equipment manufacturers, OEMs, uh, to collaborate with to bring new products to new markets. So where IBM spends $100 million dollars uh, each year supporting Linux. Um, if you don't know Linux, it's the open source uh, software or um, operating system. 50% um, for general improvements and 50% for specific improvements for IBM gear. Others spend about 800 million a year uh, of the equivalent types of um, funding. IBM creates value through Linux. It also donates uh, tools and patents. So one of the ways Linux started up was uh, IBM releasing a whole series of patents to the community saying that we want you to create something here. Use, this, use these patents. We, there's a complete amnesty on it. We're not going to charge you for them. Um, and they basically donated this to the society, which seems ridiculous. It seems like they're giving away their hard-earned property but as a result, they've gained drast uh, drastically in terms of their product development processes through it. The other example is Procter & Gamble. Uh, they had a uh, very closed organization. Uh, 
uh, Weidman said, we invented, not invented here. I don't know if you've heard of that slogan. Um, and Procter & Gramble had a, a huge crisis in the year 2000. They missed a series of quarterly financial estimates. Their stock crashed. Uh, the company was in dire straits. Um, and their CEO, Jager, was fired. Now, when they were trying to diagnose what happened uh, in that company, they said the problem was growth. So they were still producing good products. They were still hitting their targets, but they weren't producing to any new markets or any new technologies. And they basically put this down to the fact that they were too closed and not open and not diversifying. Um, so they, they completely reformed their business model to a more open one um, and created this connect and develop strategy, as in connecting with other organizations and quickly created uh, these three quite successful brands here. So the Crest, Spinbrush, Swifter Dusters, and Ole uh, Regenerist. They put in a number of procedures uh, in order to make this happen, such as uh, technology scouts, legal templates for IP partnering, investments in innovation and intermediaries. And the goal now became, um, the goal now was to become the open innovation partner of choice. So rather than saying we're going to be closed up and we're going to do our own product development, now it's we want everybody to want, want to work with us and share our IP. Here's where they were in 2002, and here's where they were in 2007. So just by a few simple measures, reorientating their business model, uh, they went from uh, roughly 10% external funded R&D to 50% external funded R&D. And here's a nice example. Um, Eli Lilly um, is a pharmaceutical firm. And if you go on their website, they'll have various pages on open innovation where they've uh, formally strategized how they're going to do this. And this includes how they're going to choose partners who they can rely on and trust and can deliver uh, the R&D they're expecting of them, and also a, a drug delivery process. So when they're working with them, how do they go about developing together a drug of choice? Another really nice example, and if any of you got time, check out this, um, this link here. This guy, Ben Miller, I think it is. Yeah, Ben Millen has created this, this network map of uh, basically the Apple iPhone and all its interacting companies in terms of the technology based underneath the iPhone. Uh, but I just wonder, who thinks that Apple, when you look at the iPhone, was a, a, a closed company? Does anyone have an opinion? So we've got two. So why would you say they're a closed company? Get out the back. Uh, for example, the three players from the beginning had to use I, uh, iTunes. Mm -hmm. right? and, and all their things are intercompatible, but not really compatible with the external products. Absolutely. So although you can see from these maps here, well, you can't see too well. I'll have to turn the lights down. Um, but there are hundreds of different interconnecting technologies to develop the iPhone. But Apple are still seen as quite a closed company because they use all this proprietary software. Um, because their MP3 players can only be used and interface with other Apple products rather than external. So they were seen as quite a closed company. So just because you, you have lots of uh, connecting technologies doesn't necessarily mean you're open. So just to uh, summarize, uh, the benefits of open innovation, you'll gain from multiple sources of, uh, of ideas and parallel discovery, uh, faster exchange of ideas through innovation actor networks and shared development, lower cost, skilled labor and more mobile and independent labor, the ability to outsource um, more agile, uh, better able to adapt with uncertain markets and technology, more adaptive and efficient, um, and nicely you end uh, knowledge monopolies. So uh, monopolies based around uh, IP, holding IP close. So, go ahead. I think the same idea to use really creative processes like music as well, like open source music. Uh, I, I don't know if, um, I don't think music really really has the uh, the same parallels in a sense. 
I can't remember the last uh, court case where somebody was saying another artist was ripping off uh, their music, uh, apart from when they actually directly copy it. Um, I, I, I think there's, there's reasons to think that would be a, it would be good, but, but generally speaking, the music industry is all about attribution. So as long as uh, somebody's name is attributed to a certain music, uh, certain tune, and they get the rights to it, and they, they receive money for it, they're happy for collaboration. They're happy to work on things together. Um, so in that way, it's open. It practices open innovation, uh, but they still have their own property. The stuff that they create, they want the rewards for, and they want the royalties for. Um, I, I think the best parallel between the music industry and this seeing. Uh, collaborating artists. So where some artists will open up and collaborate and join together on certain musical expeditions with others, open innovation is where companies join up with other companies and try create technologies and products together. <coughs> Go ahead. So do you think that could be an Achilles for Apple to, in the future, mm -hmm. to not be open? Because others are gaining the same technology and they are open. Yeah, I, I was reading a few articles on this, and uh, it was kind of it was the red herring of the technology world. Apple. I mean, every academic is saying around the world, you need to be more open. It makes all the all the sense in the world to be open, um, and they don't quite know why it's working for Apple. So it, it could well be a big collapse when when things just don't go right or their next product doesn't work for them. Um, it could really be a Achilles heel, um, but at the moment. They seem to be doing pretty well. Thomas? Hello. I think I have a quick comment. Because I think on Friday, last Friday, we actually discussed this quite a bit. I, I, at least I discussed it uh, with a lot of the groups. That uh, in some of the groups, you had like f four mechanical engineers or, you know, four uh, engineers of one certain DTU branch and not, uh, you know, that many representatives of other branches. No matter what happens, you will have to think about these things because when you sit in front of an investor, when you think you sit in front of a potential partner or whatever, you need to argue, be able to argue that we know who we'll, we're going to collaborate with. We know we're not sufficient within the group. We know we need to go somewhere else to find the competencies for this thing to happen. So. Um, uh, if that's, you know, uh, that'll get you so far as to be actually defined as an open, you know, as being engaged in open design, I don't know, because maybe you still have the, the, the patent protections and things like that in there, but, you know, you really need to think about these things because uh, it's, it's essentially also about your credibility. Do you know where to go and get the correct resources and the correct competencies? So think about that. That's right. And just in addition to that, if you start up a, a company now, you will probably be a small cog in a much bigger wheel. So open innovation allows you to be that smaller cog, to just hold the baton for that smaller, smaller period of time. Perhaps you can provide a small bit of technology or a small service to a larger company's product development. Or perhaps you need to rely on other companies to do parts of your products and service development for you. Um, so that's why open innovation is, is very critical for startups like you guys. Um, we've got a small presentation now, it'll just be 10 minutes from uh, Stardust, um, and then we'll take a 15 minutes break, but I'll just get them to do the presentation before the break. Are you guys ready? Do you want to come in then? Yep. Um. Thank you. <coughs> West. Jeff. Hi. Hi. Tom. Uh, I think they're waiting for your presentation now, so yes. we better get it on. Yes. Don't take that.
Are you okay to shout? We'll shout. Yeah, you'll shout. Fine. Which one is it? It's you pitch. Uh, I've just offered, so uh, I've just offered, he said he'll shout. Okay, great. I'm just thinking about the performance well. It's off. Okay, so I mentioned uh, Stardust last week. Uh, this is a, an innovation and startup, or entrepreneurship and startup organization, mainly based at CBS, but they do have a uh, representation here at DTU as well. Uh, so I think they'd like to do a, a small pitch for you now, if that's okay. Thank Over you. to you, uh, if you introduce yourselves. Yes, please. of course. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Marcus Strarup. These are my associates, Katrin and Martin, over there. Um, we're here today to tell you about your opportunity to participate in the Beat Delete. Uh, Beat Delete is a case competition, which is, as uh, was just said, based at Copenhagen Business School. Um, if we look at what it is more exactly, in 2002, the Copenhagen Business School case competition was launched. Since then, every year, 12 teams have been flown in from all around the world to participate in this case competition. <clears throat> it quickly became very highly regarded, so in 2009, we decided to expand this concept and allow other students to try to solve this case as well. Um, so since then, it's been a Scandinavian case competition, and today it's actually the largest case competition in Scandinavia. Now, what the case is exactly is it's a real-life business case. So what you're able to do is last year we looked at H&M, where H&M presents a case, and then you and a team of up to four people try to solve this case. We've also had Tivoli and Shipstead from, um, from Norway and, and Denmark and Sweden. So it's truly a Scandinavian concept. Now, if we look at who can participate in this, firstly, as said, you need to be an undergraduate or a graduate student at a Scandinavian university. You need to make a team of up to four students, so you can be one, two, three, or four students, um, and you can participate from wherever you want. Because the format is such that you email in your solution, 10 PowerPoint slides and one page executive summary, when you're done. The top five teams are then invited to the Beat the Elite Finals <coughs> at Copenhagen Business School to present in front of our jury. Uh, and we work with BCG consultants to select these finalists. So it's, um, Katrin would like to tell a little bit about more why you should participate. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. So, so these are the dates that you need to reserve in your calendar if you would like to be the lead. So the case will be revealed on Wednesday, the 29th of February at 10 o'clock. And if you've already signed up your team by then, you will receive the, email, uh, the case material sent to you by email. Otherwise, you will always be able to download it uh, at our website, casecompetition.com. The case material will be in, from, in form of a binder, and this binder includes all background information about the company, as well as a description of the current business problem the company is facing today. Then you will literally have 24 hours to solve the case, and by 10 o'clock the next day, you will have to hand in 10 PowerPoint slides and one page to execute the summary. Later that day, we will call in consultants from the Foster Consulting Group that will pick out the top five solutions that will, that will be selected to go through to the finals. And the finals take place at Copenhagen Business School on Friday the 2nd of March, the day after you handed in the solution. So why should you participate? <coughs> well, two years ago, the winners of Beat the Elite of the Tivoli case, they were actually called in after the competition to the headquarters of Tivoli in Copenhagen. And they were asked to present their idea to the executive board. And the executive board really, really liked the idea. And they had an idea to strengthen the revenue base of, uh, of Tivoli, to, uh, to make uh, better use of uh, all the cruise ships that are visited in Copenhagen every summer. So this idea has actually been implemented this year uh, in Copenhagen in close cooperation with the group. And this is exactly why I would personally like to participate, because I would like to make an impact. But of course, there are various reasons for why one would like to participate in such a case competition. For the most obvious reason, you would like to challenge yourself. I mean, you will spend 24 hours digging into your own toolbox, using all your skills and creativity 
to solve this real-life business case. You will for sure strengthen your case-solving communication skills. For others, this might sound quite interesting as this will definitely differentiate your CV. So if you're, for example, interested in pursuing a career in, in uh, consulting, this will definitely look really good on your CV, as this, as this will prove that you're able to put uh, your theoretical knowledge into a practical real-life business setting. And that's exactly what the BCT consultants would like to see, for example. If you are selected to go through the finals, you will spend an entire day at Copenhagen Business School. You will start in the morning presenting your case solution to a prominent jury that consists of top executives, industry experts, and consultants from the Boston Consulting Group. You will also meet ambitious students from all across Scandinavia. So this is a great opportunity for you to expand your network. You will also participate, well, if you win, be the lead. You will be presented in front of 500 people, and you will participate in the award banquet in the evening, and you will spend the night at the luxurious hotel downtown Copenhagen. Everyone receives feedback, not only the finalists. The finalists will receive live feedback, so of course preferable, but everyone receives feedback within one week from the competition, and this will definitely help you develop your skills even further. But that's not all. We also made a deal with our six preferred partners, Carlsberg, Scandinavia and Tobacco Group, Saxo Bank, Foster Consulting Group, Deloitte and Wunderman. And those companies would like to invite the winners of Bid Daily to their headquarters to, uh, for an internship of their own choice for one day. So if you're, for example, interested in investment banking, you could spend a day on the trading floor at Saxo Bank. But if you're interested in consulting, you could get a tailored career consulting from uh, BCG consultants. If you're interested in uh, pursuing a career within management, a day with the CEO of Center and Tobacco Group might be very interesting for you. And why are the companies doing this? That's because they really believe that the winners of Big, of big the Elite are truly the uh, leaders of tomorrow. And they would definitely like to meet you guys. <coughs> so I hope that you're all very interested in participating in this competition and if you would like to sign up your team of one to four persons, you can send us an email to bitdelete.casecompetition.com. But if you are looking for teammates or you simply just want to expand your network and form a team of perhaps, uh, perhaps a mixed team, one from CBS, one from DTU, one from KU, one from ITU, or if you would like to meet students from the other Scandinavian countries, you can use this tool. It's called Beat the Elite Match, and you can find it on Facebook. And then you can register your profile, and you'll find your dream team. Yes. <clears throat> so um, if you have any further questions, we'd love to answer them. Otherwise, you'll obviously be able to find more information on our Facebook page, our web page, um, or just simply email us, and we'll be happy to answer whatever. So are there any questions? We will also be placed at the in the canteen in the building 101 all day from 11 to 2 o'clock if you want to stop by. And we also have chocolates so if you just want to swing by and get some that's fine yeah. as well. We also have okay. Well thank you very much for your time then. Okay thank you very much. Uh, if we take a 15 minute break now and be back at half past I'll see you soon. <laughs>